Good morning, and welcome to our fourth installment in our series entitled the Center for Clinical and Translational Science Inventor Showcase. My name's Rebecca Jackson. I'm the director of the CCTS, a university-wide center supported by the National Institutes of Health National Center for Advancing Translational Science that is focused on accelerating the translation of scientific discovery to new prevention, diagnostic strategies, and treatments to improve human health. One way that we do this is through activities such as the Inventor Showcase, a collaborative effort between the CCTS, Nationwide Children's Hospital, the Office of Research, and the OSU Office of Corporate Engagement. The goal of these showcases is simple, to stimulate conversations and awareness among the members of our university community about the potential of innovation, commercialization, and entrepreneurship as a viable translational option for dissemination of insights that are made at the bench, the bedside, the community, or populations as viable translational options that have the greatest impact. In this series, we take a village and bring together many different skills and expertise to bring an idea from concept to market. Through the power of stories, we hope you gain some insights into the challenges that arise and the lessons that are learned by our inventors at Ohio State University and nationwide, and then can bring these insights to your own work and interests by highlighting just the varied ways and pathways that one might transverse the innovation process. This summer, given the impact of the COVID-19 on research and academic activities across Ohio State, our nation, and globally. We have modified our format slightly to highlight stories of emerging innovations and inventions that have arisen in response to some of the most pressing needs associated with the COVID-19 health crisis. We believe that these stories of rapid innovative responses to this crisis point out ways that our inventors have used principles of innovation to identify pressing needs and then develop and test new innovations that can be adopted to meet a wide range of complex problems that COVID-19 has presented. As all of us are aware, COVID-19 has profoundly influenced all of our lives. It has changed our approaches across the board from simple daily activities such as taking a walk around the block or going grocery shopping to the way that we deliver health care. Its person-centric impact globally has been overwhelming and devastating. For example, yesterday it was reported that more than 8.8 .8 million persons across the world have been confirmed to have COVID-19 and tragically more than 465,000 persons have died. Since March, this public health tsunami has stretched our health systems beyond their capacity from the lack of adequate PPP or reagents for viral testing to ensuring the presence of adequate ventilators for the management of our most critically ill patients. These challenges have been daunting, but in the face of this public health crisis, we have also seen hope emerge. From the selfless actions of our healthcare workers and those who provide critical functions to our communities, to the creativity and the tenacity of teams across government, private sector, and academia, who have embraced innovation to address many of these early and emerging challenges. Here at Ohio State, we have seen literally dozens of examples of innovative response to well-articulated needs. Today, we begin that conversation of how we can enable other ideas and efforts to move forward to help us address problems in the days to come. The responsibility for helping to address this pandemic is all of ours. Here at the CCTS, we contribute to enhancing innovation through our four foundational principles, convening individuals together through programs such as this to address stakeholder-defined opportunities, connecting individuals representing multiple disciplines and expertise to work together as highly effective teams that is necessary for success, catalyzing innovation and experimentation through provision of pilot project support and just-in-time vouchers, and finally, enabling success 
than the provision of an ecosystem that supports innovation. We hope you will reach out to us or visit our website or the COVID-19 websites housed by the OSU Office of Research and the Infectious Disease Institute to find resources and support, as well as expertise to pursue your ideas. Working together, we can make a difference. It is now my honor to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Syed Hussein. Dr. Hussein is an Associate Professor of Surgery at The Ohio State University Wexner Medical Center. His clinical and outcomes research interests include evaluation and application of new surgical techniques and technologies to the field of colorectal surgery with a special focus towards the utilization of minimally invasive platforms for the treatment of colorectal disease. In addition to his clinical research efforts, Dr. Hussein also has a keen interest in medical device development. It is really bringing together his interests in developing and enhancing medical devices, along with his commitment to improving patient outcomes that provided the impetus for the work you're gonna hear about today on enhancing ventilator designs to address the need of COVID-19 critically ill patients. Please join me in providing a warm welcome to Dr. Hussein as our first speaker today for the COVID-19 CCTS Inventor Showcase. Dr. Hussein. Thank you for, for the very kind introduction. I hope you guys can see my screen. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank CCTS not only for the support in the form of a voucher, which was essential for this research, but also to give me the opportunity to speak in this forum. Um, I'm one of the practicing surgeons in the Department of Surgery, and I'll talk to you uh, today about increasing ventilator capacity uh, during COVID crisis. So I'll start with a brief introduction of a ventilator. So a ventilator is nothing but a, a mechanical lung. Um, it provides two vital functions. Um, the first one is ventilation, which means moving air in and out of uh, lungs. And the second one is oxygenation, means providing oxygen into the bloodstream, which is essential for living. In the picture here, you can see a ventilator, which is attached to two of our uh, uh, simulated patients, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, a ventilator can be a life-saving intervention in patients who, for, are, who are either too weak to breathe for themselves or uh, who have uh, lungs that have been damaged uh, to an extent where they're unable to provide enough oxygen to their systems. Um, it acts as a bridge to allow those patients time to recover while their lungs heal. And once their lungs have healed, we wean them off of the ventilator. Because of the vital function a ventilator performs, it, is, it has a lot, very complex operation. It has a lot, lot of safety features built into it. Uh, and it can be, um, uh, if not used properly, it can be, uh, um, uh, it can cause significant damage to the patient. So um, we all know um, that the COVID pandemic caused a, a, a global shortage of ventilators. Uh, just the sheer number of patients were so much that uh, the number of ventilators that were out available for use was just quickly overwhelmed. Uh, not only the number of ventilators were overwhelmed, but the other problem we faced is one, once a COVID patient was put on the ventilator, it took them on an average 10 days compared to three to four days that we usually use for non-COVID patients. So that means that it took out the available ventilators out of our, uh, our inventory very quickly. So something needed to be done. The obvious solution was to, uh, to increase the production uh, however, that's not, that was not a very pragmatic solution because increasing production takes months and then delivery, the logistics associated with getting those ventilators to places where they were needed takes another several weeks. So we had to come up with some sort of a quick uh, solution. Um, while we are, you know, during the, the entire world is facing this, uh, this problem, we are starting to see the first few cases in the United States. And that was around March 13th and 15th, where you know, first uh, we, we had a, just a few, a handful number of cases in US. But we were seeing these, these news headlines from across the world, especially from Italy, where we knew that their healthcare system was completely overwhelmed. 
and the doctors there were had they, they were they were faced with this horrible decision of uh, deciding which patient should go on a ventilator. Uh, as a physician, this is really a horrendous situation to be in, where you have to pick and choose which one of your patient gets to live and which one, you know, for the lack of a better word, you just let die. So, so that of course um, uh, created a lot of uh, um, uh, for for physicians in the United States, for uh, a lot of our colleagues here in Ohio. Uh, it it created a, a lot of concern and uh, gave us even more of an incentive to work on, on some sort of a solution. Um, at the, around the same time on March 20th, I received uh, a message from one of our family friends, uh, Abby Gehring, who, who incidentally works for Battelle. And she shared this article, which was published a while ago. This was in 2006, uh, where um, the authors described a simple method of just splitting a vent um, by attaching additional tubes and using it for four patients. Um, of course, they never tried it clinically or never tested it in a, in a system where they could actually measure the performance of the system. All they did was attach four tubes to a ventilator and uh, figured out that the ventilator has the capacity to deliver the large, you know, a large volume of breath that would be enough for four patients at a time. Um, after this, there were several other articles that kind of replicated the same concept. However, as soon as I saw this article, I knew there is a problem with this. The biggest problem with this kind of an approach is the compliance issue. Uh, compliance of lung is, is in, you know, in, in simpler terms, is elasticity of the lung. Uh, every patient has different, and their lungs are, you know, there are no two patients that have exactly identical lungs. Some lungs are easy to inflate, others are stiffer and require more pressure for inflation. So you can imagine if you attach in parallel two patients with very different lung compliances to the same ventilator and uh, give them uh, a breath, the large amount of that volume is gonna to go to the patient with softer lungs, uh, while the patient with, uh, uh, with stiffer lungs will get either no or very little volume. There are two problems with this. Not only we cannot measure how much, exactly how much volume each one of these patients is getting, which is essential for mechanical ventilation, uh, but, we, but it also exposes the patient with softer lung to what we call barotrauma, means overinflation of the lung uh, causing, uh, could potentially cause rupture of the lung in, uh, uh, in a condition called pneumothorax, which can be life-threatening. So here's a demonstration of how uh, this looks in the lab. So the test lung on the top, these, both of these lungs are attached to the same ventilator. The test lung on the top is a softer lung, whereas the one at the bottom is a more stiff lung. And you can clearly see that the softer lung is getting much larger volume compared to the stiffer lung. So with this problem uh, in hand, uh, I knew that we have to come up with a way that, um, uh, has, that provides us at least two of the, uh, these abilities. Number one, the ability to measure the volume that goes to each patient. And number two, the ability to somehow control, to somehow modify so both patients get equal amount of air and the patient with softer lung does not end up getting all the air while the patient with stiffer lung gets none, no, no air at all. Uh, so I knew the problem. I knew what we need to do uh, to solve that. I just did not know how to do it. So, um, so at, with this question, I approached Dr. Rasko as one of our, my colleagues and good friends, and I knew that he's been uh, working with CREATE and, and they were working on uh, a lot of other inventions. So, uh, so I approached him with this idea. We discussed the, uh, uh, the potential issues associated with the ventilator splitting. We had an initial brainstorming session, and this is what we came up with. The solution must have the ability to measure and control uh, the flow to individual patient. It has to be cost effective. It should not require any additional expertise or any additional training for healthcare workers. Um, it should be very simple to operate. Um, 
it should be created using universally available materials. It should not require any specialized equipment that needs to be manufactured in a specialty uh, 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 organization or in a specialty lab, and then has to be shipped to those areas. And if there are any components uh, that are not available off the shelf, they should be easily producible using a 3D printer so it can be, uh, it can be printed locally. So while we are discussing this problem and we know that you know, this is, uh, we, we have to address this issue before we can uh, go out and tell people um, that just, you can just put two or three or four patients on a single end, uh, there were other uh, researchers who started creating YouTube videos and putting them out on the internet, uh, just describing the same thing that uh, uh, the, you know, the article that I shared with you earlier had described in 2006. When five or six of these videos came out, uh, it created, uh, it pushed uh, a joint statement. It prompted a joint statement from multiple societies, uh, including Society of Critical Care Medicine, American Association of Respiratory Care, American Society of Anesthesiologists, and, and, and pretty much every other society that takes care of uh, lung diseases came out with a, with a very strong wording against using ventilator by simply attaching additional tubing to it. And uh, uh, if I read here, they say, it is better to purpose the ventilator to a patient most likely to benefit than to fail or even cause the demise of multiple patients. Of course, they were worried about the same, same they had the same concerns that we had when, we, when I met with Dr. Uh, Vasquez. Um, What's interesting is that by March uh, 26th, New York was completely overwhelmed by COVID crisis. And despite this warning, which came out on March 26th, the same day New York governor allowed the physicians in the state to use one, a single ventilator for multiple patients. Uh, this is despite these warnings. So you can imagine they were in real dire straits at that time. I, I trained in New York and I had a ton of friends that are still working in the city. And you know, I would be on phone with them constantly and they were just telling me horrible, horrible stories about the ventilator shortage. Um, uh, and uh, so, so they, were, they started using it without any safety measures. They, they were so desperate at that time. Looking at this on March 31st, a couple days later, uh, the US Surgeon Journal came out with a statement that, sh that kind of stopped short of endorsing using single ventilator for multiple patients, but they did kind of soften the stance that were taken by those other societies by saying that if you are in a do or die situation, a life or death situation, this is what you could potentially do to save your patients. So while all of this in kind of in the background uh, uh, as I said, we met uh, with, I met with Dr. Uh, Vasquez on the 24th of March, and then Dr. Vasquez in introduced me to CDME, and we had our first meeting on the 31st. Um, we discussed the basic ventilator dynamics, and um, you know, I, pr I presented the problem, and I also told them what I think could be done to solve this problem. Uh, CDME was, I mean, they immediately came out with two uh, uh, sort of an approach, uh, two, two approaches to solve this problem. Um, and they recommended that I approach CCTS and apply for an emergency COVID voucher to get the funding that's needed to develop those, uh, those solutions. Um, so on, uh, on 5th of April, I applied for the voucher and was incredible that in less than 24 hours, we had our router in our hand. So that was really expedited through the, uh, the whole application was expedited through the process. And with funding in our hands, I went back to CDME and they started working uh, on developing those flow valves. Um, so at this point, I will hand it over to Walt Hansen of CDME to, uh, to go over the process of uh, development of these valves. Thanks, Dr. Hussain. Hello everybody, my name is Walt Hansen. I'm a mechanical engineer with CDME. So we were asked to look at low cost, low complexity ways to enable ventilator sharing between patients with differing needs 
And as Dr. Hussein described, this is complicated, not just by variations in patient lung size, but also by variation in lung compliance. And you see there the mathematical description of compliance is the change in volume divided by the change in pressure. So the volume of air received by each patient on a shared ventilator is proportional to their lung compliance multiplied by the supply pressure, eventually, at steady state. When I say at steady state, I mean the point when the pressure inside the patient lung is no longer changing. So that would be when the pressure inside the lung is equal to the supply pressure. But breathing is dynamic, and it takes time for the lung pressure to equalize to the supply pressure. And that means that the volume of air with each breath, the, the tidal volume that they receive, is also determined by the airflow rate. And this is important because it let us simplify our control mechanism from pressure control to flow rate control. And on the bottom of this slide, you can see schematics of a simple pressure regulator and a simple flow control valve. And you'll notice that the pressure regulator requires several extra components that make the design and the manufacturing of it more complex and expensive than the comparatively simple flow control valve. Uh, next slide, please. So we decided that the simplest approach is to put a flow meter and a flow control valve on each patient airline. The meter measures and displays the flow rate and the valve lets us adjust it. And this gives us the ability to indirectly control the volume of air going to each patient. So we identified multiple off-the-shelf flow meters. The simplest, cheapest design is the mechanical variable area flow meter. This is the kind you might have seen on compressed gas cylinders. It has a, a ball that floats inside of a clear plastic housing. Simple design. But we were concerned that the variable area flow meter might present too much of a restriction and create too big a pressure drop between the ventilator and the patient. So we also purchased an electronic flow meter, which is not ideal because it requires a control system and a screen and some programming to display the flow rate, but it also creates almost no airline restriction and very little pressure drop. And we also designed a 3D printed flow control valve because we wanted to enable hospitals to quickly make their own valves as needed. And we purchased an off the shelf valve to benchmark our 3D printed design and to make sure that we had a backup in case the 3D printed design didn't work. And we also evaluated a variable area flow meter with an integral uh, control valve. And then we designed and assembled a test system to measure the back pressure um, and to evaluate flow control with all of the valve and meter combinations I just mentioned. Uh, next slide, please. I won't say much about this slide. I just included it for illustration to show you the types of meters and valves we investigated and uh, the exact part numbers that we purchased. Um, next slide, please. This is a schematic of our test setup. Uh, starting on the right side, we supplied high pressure uh, air from an electric powered compressor and then we put it through a precision low pressure regulator to simulate the actual pressure range that's coming from a ventilator. And we split the outlet of the regulator into two lines and ran through our various meter and valve combinations. And we put the outlet of one side, uh, line two on the diagram there, we put the outlet into a water column to create some back pressure that kind of simulates a patient with lower lung compliance, kind of what you would see there. And uh, using that setup, then we measured the pressure drop across each of the components using a digital pressure meter. And we verified our ability to control the flow rate in each line independently, even when one line had that back pressure from the water column and the other didn't. So that was a good sign. Um, next slide, please. So here is a summary of our test results. Really the major takeaway was just that we were able to control flow rate in each line independently. 
and that the difference in pressure drop between the worst and the best combinations was only about two inches of water, which is low enough that we can say that the pressure drop is roughly equal for all of the combinations we tested. Uh, so that, that alleviated our fear of the, of the large pressure drop and it led us to recommend further testing with the two most attractive combinations in terms of simplicity and cost. The variable area flow meter with the integral valve and the variable area flow meter in combination with our 3D printed valve. Uh, next slide, please. This is our last slide. It just shows some details of the 3D printed valve that we designed. Um, it was just, it's a gate valve design made from three components using Hewlett Packard's Maldi Jet Fusion printer. It's kind of an advanced 3D printer, but we felt this would give us the best chance for success on our first, on our first shot. Um, low cost FDM printing, which, which are the, the sub thousand dollar printers that you, that you see pretty much everywhere, that may be possible, um, but the resolution and the strength and the porosity are potential concerns with, with that. Um, testing showed that our gate valve design wasn't the best. We got very little flow control, almost no flow control until the valve was almost completely closed. And then control at that point was very touchy. So our next design, if we get a chance to improve it, we'll seek to improve the flow control adjustability. And maybe we'll also look at FDM printing. So that's all I have. Uh, back to you, Dr. Hussein. All right, so going back to, uh, so thanks Walt for, for the technical description. Um, we'll go back to where I had left off uh, we, to our project timeline. So um, CCTS, uh, 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 excuse me, uh, uh, CDME gave me the valve on the 24th of April. And uh, we did our first trial um, uh, at uh, uh, the respiratory therapy lab here at OSU uh, Vectra Medical Center on the 29th. That was kind of a dry run for us to see if, uh, if the, uh, the flow meters and the valves actually work. And that test demonstrated that you know, our, our uh, intervention was working. However, at the respiratory therapy lab, what I did not have is the ability to simulate patients with different lung compliances, and also the ability to actually measure the flow to each one of those, uh, um, uh, each one of those patients, something kind of similar to what uh, CDME did in their lab um, model. So, so I knew the only place that I could actually simulate patient care experience would be the High Fidelity Simulation Center. Um, now, what you got to keep in mind is that this is uh, kind of in uh, late April, early June. That's uh, in the middle of COVID crisis in Ohio. And uh, the university had placed a moratorium on uh, non-COVID related research. All of the non-essential staff was asked to work from home. Many non-essential um, departments were, were closed. So uh, the simulation center was actually closed at that time. So I approached uh, simulation center um, uh, leadership, and I explained my research, my idea to them, and uh, and hats off to them. They immediately recognized the importance of this research, and not only did they open the facility for me, not, not only did they give me the access uh, to the same center, they also um, provided me with the professional help uh, from us uh, uh, from one of their professionals, uh, um, uh, and who actually had to come in from home. Uh, as Scott Winfield came in from home to help me run this simulation, and I'm really thankful for him to do this. So on the fourth, we tested this at the Sim Center. Um, uh, as you can see, this is a picture of the Sim Center here, uh, where we have two simulated patients. We have a full range of monitors, which can do a full uh, kind of a respiratory monitoring of uh, uh, of these simulated patients. So these are the meters um, uh, that the, the CDME had provided to me. Um, what the first test that we ran was with 900 ml of volume, uh, 900 ml of a breath with each breath, and um, one patient was set 
one simulated patient was set in a way that they had normal lungs, whereas the other simulated patient was set in a way that they had diseased lungs, so their compliance was much lower than the normal patient. As you can see here, our uh, meters were able to, and I'm not sure if you can see the ball floats here clearly, um, but uh, our meters were able to pick the discrepancy in flow between uh, the two patients. Next, we went back to uh, the actual simulator readings. And what you can see is a patient with 100% compliance, that is normal lungs, out of 900 ml that was being delivered by the ventilator, the patient with normal lung was getting about, you know, roughly about 600 of that, whereas the patient with uh, diseased lung or more kind of a stiff lung was getting very little volume. So that kind of, that was consistent with what we were, with what we were looking at our meters. Then we adjusted the meters in a, a, to a point where both the ball floats were kind of at the same level, uh, indicating that both patients are getting uh, the similar flow rate. And then again, we went back to look at the similar readings. And here you can see uh, that it was fairly equal between the two patients. Out of 900 ml, both of them are now getting about 400, uh, 450 uh, ml of air. Then we repeated this again with 1100 ml, again the same thing. Before adjustment, there's a huge discrepancy between the ball floats. There's a huge discrepancy between the airflow uh, to two patients. Uh, after adjustment, the ball floats are kind of at the same level. And again, the, um, and the similar also suggests that uh, we have corrected the uh, tidal volume to each one of these patients, despite the fact that these patients have two very different lungs. So this proved our concept and, and, uh, and we were very happy with our results. Now this is a simplified diagram. As you can see, we kind of stayed true to our original commitment that we're gonna use simple uh, um, components which are available off the shelf. So you can see all of these connectors uh, and the tubing are simple tubing which are available anywhere where they, and in any hospital where they use the ventilator. These are the meters. Um, you know, these are flow meters that medical personnel use on a daily basis. We are very comfortable with using these flow meters. And these are the 3D printed valves and connectors that we use. So these are the only two components that require 3D printing. Uh, and that can be done simple. It's a fairly simple process can be done locally at, um, any, in any one of the facilities. So of course there are limitations. This solution is only for life or death situations. We do not recommend that you use it for routine uh, purposes. Um, it is not ideal. It does not provide all the functions of a ventilator. Uh, and we of course have not done any real clinical trials. And I hope that we never have to do those clinical trials here in the US, but at least now we have a solution. Now in the end, I would like to thank all of these centers that were involved uh, in, in, uh, 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 in creating the solution for the problem. As you saw from our timeline, from the con concept to the final product and testing of the final product, we, we took about six, actually under six weeks, which is truly incredible considering so many centers were involved. Um, given the you know, short amount of time we have today, three of these uh, 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 centers would be highlighted um, in today's talk. And with that, I'll hand over to uh, Danny Vasquez and Amanda Haney of uh, CREATE to talk about their center. Thank you. Hello, thank you, Dr. Hussein, Dr. Matthew, Dr. Jackson, and CCTS for having us here today. My name is Amanda Haney and I'm here with Dr. Daniel Vasquez to speak with you about CREATE, the Center for Research, Education, and Transdisciplinary Exploration. CREATE was founded in uh, 2018 and our organizing principle is no one of us is as bright as all of us. Our mission is to create a path to innovation by forming transdisciplinary collaborations among professionals, students, the center's team of ex clinical experts, and our partners. Our goal is to pioneer solutions to improve systems, practices, and patient outcomes. And our focus is innovation in education, research, and community partnerships. Um, now I'd like to introduce our center's founder, Dan Dr. Daniel Vasquez, and he'll discuss um, a little bit about our pathway for collaborative in innovation. Good morning, everybody. 
Uh, my name is Dr. Vasquez. I am a trauma and critical care surgeon uh, with a passion for innovation. Uh, I started Create with uh, Mandy uh, some years ago. Um, it was a grassroots effort based on our three pillars that you see here, education, research, and uh, community or outreach. Uh, and we've had the privilege of working on multiple projects, uh, including Dr. Hussein's uh, ventilator splitter project. Um, Doctor, as you have heard, Dr. Hussein has approached me or had approached me for help in the beginning. Um, and I provided just some minimal clinical guidance. Um, I, I really have to give all the credit uh, to him. He's been uh, phenomenal in this, in this endeavor. Uh, and I also facilitated some meetings, including a meeting, uh, the original meeting with the, the CDME and, uh, and other meetings with CC, CCTS and the SIM Center as well, and our respiratory therapists. Um, next slide, please. So along these lines, um, CREATE has a team of clinical experts to provide a uh, really a clinical immersion for inventors or what I, we like to call a, providing a wet lab. Um, and this is really what sets CREATE apart is this uh, excellent team of physicians, including anesthesia, surgery, advanced care providers, nurses, respiratory therapy, pharmacy, just to name a few. Next slide. So our process, um, we've created a pathway to innovation, which starts with an idea. Um, then we form a transdisciplinary team, which is really the key. Um, then we innovate the solution. And once the solution has been reached, uh, we will present it to the Technology Commercialization Office at The Ohio State University for evaluation. So note that CREATE has uh, helped not just physicians, but it has helped uh, nurses, has helped high school students, undergraduate, master students, and this is just to name a few, which is a reflection of its uh, true transdisciplinary spirit. Um, and now Amanda, Mandy will talk a little more about our, our center. Hello, um, next up will be Mary Hoffman Pancake and she'll talk with you about her center CDME. Thank you, Amanda. My name is Mary Hoffman Pancake and I'm the program manager for the Biomedical Devices Lab and it's the Center for Design and Manufacturing Excellence. Um, CDME's mission is to enhance American competitiveness through the introduction of, two tech, of new technologies and how we achieve that is through student and product um, development. And it's through industry and government funded, I'm sorry, Tanya, next slide, please. Thanks, thank you. It's through industry and government funded projects that undergraduate students gain hands-on mentor-based experiences through integrating new technologies into market-ready applications. CDMEs work with over 150 partners on over 350 applied engineering projects since our inception just five years ago. Next slide, please. CDME is what we refer to as the manufacturing port of entry into Ohio State. We bring together students, industry experienced professionals, faculty to help solve problems and develop new technologies. Um, CDME employed over 60 undergraduate students this past year, and we also employ about two dozen industry experienced professionals like Walt and myself who mentor and supervise the students as they work alongside us on these projects. CDME is what we call an applied engineering center. We operate a 28,000 square foot manufacturing facility on the west campus of Ohio State University, and it houses over $12 million worth of advanced manufacturing equipment. Next slide, please. CDME has extensive in-house capabilities that range from additive manufacturing to electronics and controls, to injection molding and uh, testing and assembly that we can bring to bear to help develop pro new products. Um, each CDME project is assigned a project manager like myself, and we follow an industry-based new product development model in which we apply project management principles of defining tasks with gated reviews. 
So we clearly identify what the deliverables are with a project scope, a schedule, and a budget for completion. Next slide, please. CDME has three signature labs that work together to use our engineering capabilities that help translate technologies from an idea to manufacturing. We work with many different industries, but today's presentation we're focused on just the medical applications. So our biomedical devices lab has worked with Ohio State and nationwide children's clinicians as a core service through the CCTS program. We've ad advanced technologies such as an electroceutical dressing for wound healing, a robotic cochlear implant system, a junctional tourniquet, um, an oral surgery device, just to name a few of the several medical innovations we've worked on. And in addition to Dr. Hussein's ventilator splitter, CDME was also a key resource in supporting some other COVID-19 response projects such as the nasopharyngeal swabs to help meet the supply shortage for the Wexner Medical Center in the state of Ohio, and also isolation boxes that provided, and still provide, they're in the hospitals, additional protection to the frontline clinicians performing intubations. And CDME doesn't only just work with internal inventors here at Ohio State and nationwide, but we also work with external medical device startup companies and other clients to help commercialize their technology. Next slide, please. The Biomedical Devices Lab also leverages our other signature labs to provide solutions to medical device needs. Our additive manufacturing or 3D printing lab is managed by Dr. Ed Herdrick, and we can print not only the polymer-based materials, but also metals, ceramics, and other medical grade materials. Next slide, please. Our Artificially Intelligent Manufacturing Systems Lab, which is managed by Walt Hansen and Dr. Mike Graber, has a multi-robot configuration with an adaptive AI or artificially intelligent automo automation platform to create unique manufacturing cell configurations. Next slide, please. So our center works with clinicians and medical device startup companies in translating medical innovations from, as they say, bench to bedside, while involving our undergraduate students and giving them experiences necessary to be able to contribute to the medical de device industry upon graduation. So in summary, if you can articulate what you need, CDME can help you translate your idea into a physical solution and help you move down the development path of commercialization. Thank you. And with that, I turn it over to, uh, to James Reed and Dr. Cheryl File. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is James Reed, and I'm the Associate Director for the Clinical Skills Center. Uh, I'm jo joined by Dr. Cheryl File, who's our Medical Director. Uh, next slide, please. So the Clinical Skills Education and Assessment Center is housed uh, loosely within the College of Medicine. We're also sort of um, uh, connected very closely to the Medical Center itself, so we serve both populations. Uh, CSAC is a state-of-the-art training center. Uh, our focus is on advancing patient care through education initiatives. Uh, part of that in, in the promotion of the high quality clinical education is to be innovative in our learning strategies and techniques. And so it's uh, always something that we're paying attention to, whether it be building remote encounters, both for simulated uh, high fidelity scenarios and also with regard to our standardized patient program. Uh, or pulling in uh, folks like Dr. Hussein who have innovative ideas that they need to test on some of our high fidelity equipment. Um, we are located in Pryor Hall uh, and we have about 24,000 total square feet of space uh, with a variety of different simulators and um, venues in which different training activities can take place. Uh, Dr. File is going to share a little bit more detail on each of those, so please advance to the next slide. So yes, to um, to continue on with what Jay was saying, I will um, I will emphasize that we do have very realistic environments. So you're looking here at our virtual operating room, um, and uh, we really are part of the translational process of taking things from uh, an innovative idea to something developed in in a lab to uh, that step prior to actual patient testing. So we can simulate um, very advanced um, processes, both in terms of physiology and also in terms of the logistic environment. You see here one of our uh, mannequins, and notice that I'm calling it a mannequin and not a dummy, uh, because these are actually very smart uh, mannequins who can simulate uh, physiology. So uh, as you got a glimpse of, uh, as Dr. Hussein was explaining his project, these mannequins can actually simulate uh, pressures, uh, lung volumes, 
uh, they can simulate response to various medications and other interventions. They're really extremely realistic. Uh, the other thing that's, uh, I think, a benefit in this environment is that we can actually record everything that we do. So we can then uh, go back and uh, watch that recording, debrief, look at the monitor uh, data, and then redo. And at the end of the day, uh, it's a safe environment. So we can test things, uh, many, of, many of which work and some of which don't, uh, but there's no injury that occurs. And I think uh, maybe other than the um, injury to the um, investigators when something doesn't, the ego when something doesn't work, but um, in general, it's a very safe environment. And so uh, that allows us really to live in the world of possibility, innovation, and creativity. Um, next slide, please. Uh, let's go over to the next slide, if we can, please. Uh, I will also just say that we have a second component to our center. So in addition to a very physiologic-based center on the upper level, we also have a standardized patient program. So uh, uh, the picture that you saw is actually a picture of our uh, second area, which is looks very much like an exam room, but it has a picture of a uh, an actor playing, playing the role of a patient. Uh, and at the end of the day, for many of these medical interventions, um, it really is the patient that is the center of what we do. So sometimes we're testing things like feasibility, usability, uh, how does something work within the context of an actual patient care space, whether that's an ICU, an office space, et cetera. We've, for example, tested new, um, uh, new medical development space to see if things are actually situated in a way that works to care for the patient. So I'll leave you with three, um, with three things. I hope that um, we've convinced you that we, our center is a, a welcome resource for um, not just for learners, but also for uh, innovators, um, uh, developers, researchers, uh, the, the creative uh, minds amongst us. Logistically, as uh, Jay mentioned, we are located in the same building as the CCTS, and so we're on the same uh, campus uh, as a number of other resources, which makes it a really easy uh, access from, uh, not just from the hospital and the medical center, but also all the resources within, within the campus. Um, and finally, I'll just say that we uh, welcome the opportunity. This was a project that um, we were very excited to uh, help with and participate in. Um, so we welcome the opportunity to uh, collaborate with uh, researchers and to hear ideas. Uh, next, it's a pleasure to introduce um, Dr. Bruce Weinberg, who will be um, handling the Q&A session. Thank you very much. Um, I'm, it was just a fascinating talk, and I appreciate um, all of everyone uh, contributing uh, to the to the discussion and featuring all the resources. Um, I wanted to draw everyone's attention to the um, to the Q and A feature at the bottom of the um, at the bottom of the uh, screens where you can ask questions. Um, and please send in questions that we can ask uh, to the to the group. Um, so um, just in the interest of time. Uh, I think we have some questions around. Uh, there's a question in the in the in the chat um, in the Q and A um, asking uh, what can be done to limit infection transmission using this uh, using this process um, that say Dr. Hussein or uh, Danny Vasquez might be good for answering. All right, I'll um, I'll start. Um, so uh, this is a great question, and this is something that we discussed while we were thinking about co-ventilating co patients. Uh, so there's uh, what we, uh, if uh, I'm, uh, I don't have access to my talk anymore, but the simplified setup that I had projected has four HEPA filters uh, attached to each arm of the circuit. So not only the inspiratory circuit for each patient has a HEPA filter, the expiratory circuit also has a HEPA filter. Uh, in addition, we used one-way valves uh, four one-way valves for each inlet and outlet of, uh, uh, of the circuit to minimize the backflow of air between the two patients. We feel that with these uh, interventions using the HEPA filters and the one-way valves, the risk of transmission of uh, infection uh, could be minimized. Uh, 
I think we have a, a number of questions um, for uh, Dr. Hussein or Mary for um, what what the environment looks like to be generating inventions from a regulatory regulatory side and also just just proceeding on this this time scale. Um, so from a regulatory point of view, um, FDA has um, uh, usually, I mean, FDA getting a, a, an invention through FDA uh, or especially a medical device through FDA is a very long, uh, laborious process. Uh, however, FDA has created exceptions for situations like COVID-19 where they have emergency use authorization or EUA as they call them. There are uh, special authorizations that are given for specific situations and uh, that can be applied for and that you, we can quickly obtain those if we need to use this uh, within the United States. Uh, thankfully, uh, the way things look like uh, COVID crisis, we are kind of seeing the tail end of it and we've also uh, gotten to a point where I doubt that um, we will get to a point where we'll have to put two patients at the same ventilator, but if we do, we can apply for the emergency use authorization from FDA, that would be the route to go. Mary, did you want to add anything to that or just anyone else? Um, no, there's just, there is the Emergency Youth Authorization Act. Um, with the ventilators, you know, there's strict regulations because there's obviously, you know, fatal health complications. If So there's strict, you know, testing and things like that. So we, we definitely need to go down that path um, to be able to show that, you know, there's equivalency and that there's, you know, um, um, in terms of, per, you know, performance for the patient and things like that. So, um, you know, they, they are accepting modifications to ventilators and things like that, but it's just, you know, testing still needs to be conducted. Right. And I would, you know, again, I would like to, to add that this is what we discussed today is really just to be used in a do, you know, kind of life or death situation. This is not something that we recommend to be used on a routine situation. So the only time I can envision this being used is in, in some sort of a real healthcare crisis, uh, like the one that we just went through. I think we have a question um, that uh, whether this, whether this approach, we have a couple of questions related to whether this approach will work for all types of ventilators, um, how similar or different they are. Um, that's probably uh, for you, Dr. Hussein. Okay, so um, so we have so far tested it uh, only on the ventilator, the, the one that we most commonly use uh, in our clinical practice here in the United States. And that's the one that's available to us in the simulation center. So we've not had the opportunity to use it uh, on a different ventilator on the older models. Um, I suspect that it will work because since it does not really alter the function of the ventilator in itself, uh, I doubt that we're gonna have any problems with this, but the, you know, the simple answer to your question is that we've not tested it with, with different types of ventilators yet. And I think, um, I think there's a, there are some other uh, questions about um, whether, um, how, how this relates to the alarm systems in ventilators um, I think there's also uh, a question of, um, well, why don't we start with that? All right. So, so uh, as you know, we discussed, ventilators are complex devices and they have a ton of safety measures built into them. Um, the ventilators can um, really identify the amount of breath that's being delivered to the patient. So given to the patient and then the amount of air that's coming back to the ventilator. Um, also, the ventilators can uh, determine the amount of pressure with which that breath, each breath is being delivered. And those alarms are built in already. Uh, physicians have uh, ability to adjust those within the safe limits. Uh, those alarms, with, with our proposed solution, those alarms continue to function unaltered. So the safeties that are built around pressure the safeties that are built around uh, the volume that's being delivered uh, and the safeties that are built around uh, uh, whether or not you know, there's a lot of resistance to airflow, 
those remain unaltered. So we really don't, don't need to, all of those safety mechanisms are still available to us when we are using this solution. Uh, the only thing that we have done with this is to add an additional layer of safety while sharing a ventilator between the two patients. And that, that layer of safety is the ability to know exactly how much volume is being delivered to each patient and the ability to control the amount of volume that goes to each patient. Now that is something uh, a, a, a ventilator would not be able to do if we were to just simply attach additional tubing and put two patients instead of one to the ventilator. The ventilator does not have the ability to know that they're downstream, there are two patients attached. It does not, it, it is a device that's built to be used for a single patient. So, so because we're using this in an, in an extraordinary circumstance um, in a, in a, for an indication that it's really not built for, we felt that we needed to add this extra layer of safety uh, to the system. There's a question about how many, uh, how many patients can use a single ventilator using your approach and whether it's appropriate um, for pediatrics. And I think, why don't we make this the last question um, so we can get people out on time? Um, I think, I mean, based on what we, um, what we tested was uh, splitting between the two patients. So we have not, so all, although a ventilator has the ability to deliver a breath large enough that could, uh, be, that could be sufficient in most cases for four patients at a time. Uh, we have not done that yet. So we have not done that testing. Uh, maybe in the future, we may, that's one of the things that we can look into. Uh, for pediatric patients, I think it's gonna be, it'll probably be the same uh, kind of an approach. I think it can be used for pediatric patient. I think uh, one thing that I would caution is that for pediatric patient, the flow meter that we would have to use because the breaths delivered to pediatric patients are very small, we would have to use a flow meter with a lower, uh, with, a, with the ability to major, measure lower flow rates compared to the flow meters that we used for, for adults. And outside of that, I think it's gonna be, but again, this is not something that we have used on smaller volumes. There is a possibility that we, when we run, when we run the simulation with much smaller volumes, like in a pediatric setting, the flow meters may not work the way they did for adult setting. So, uh, so these are the things that we'll have to keep bear in mind if we go down the route of using these for pediatric patients. Great, thank you. I'm going to turn things over to Carl and Christopher, my colleague, to, um, to, for some concluding remarks. Okay, great. Thanks everyone for joining us today and a special thanks to our panelists, Syed Hussein, Walter Hansen, Daniel Vasquez, Amanda Haney, Mary Hoffman Pancake, Cheryl File, and James Reed. Any questions that were unanswered in our Q&A session um, will be answered by email. And we encourage you, any additional questions that arise, please reach out to the panelists. We really want to keep this dialogue, conversation, and network going, as Dr. Jackson said in the introduction. Uh, Tanya, Bruce, and I would welcome any comments or suggestions for future research to be presented in our monthly seri series. And then we would also like to uh, encourage you to join us for next month's COVID-19 Inventor Showcase. That'll be on Tuesday, July 14th from 12 to one o'clock featuring Christopher Willette and Dean Lee. So with that, we wish you all have a healthy week and we plan to see you next month. Thanks very much.